Hi, this is Kendra from Pencil and Pigment, and today I'm going to be doing a beginning watercolor tutorial. Now there's going to be a lot because I don't know necessarily where you're at in your art journey when you find this video. So I'm going to start at the very beginning and I'm going to discuss in basic beginning terms all the watercolor supplies you might need, a little bit of history, and then we will get on to techniques and then a tutorial. So if there are portions or parts you're very familiar with, um, I'm going to timestamp everything in the description box. So if there are things you don't need or things you're f already fluent on, you can skip around as you see fit, as you want, and that way it'll save you time or you can watch the whole thing all the way through. The choice is yours and I hope you enjoy. Okay, the first thing we're gonna talk about is watercolor paper. Now I'm gonna tell you um, different options and then give you some of the pros and cons of that option so you can then decide what you need or want depending on what this tutorial is for. So if this is just like a fun hobby thing or a future job or is this for really nice gifts or a possible career, um, this will help you out with that. So the first one is cotton rag and this is going, <laughs> this video is gonna have a ton of info. So just feel free to either stop, pause, take notes, um, so you can create later without being overwhelmed. Um, cotton rag is taken from the name of the long fibers collected on a cotton gin that are woven into fabric. So basically this paper is made from new fibers or recycled fibers from old fabrics. So the pros of this paper are that cotton paper holds water for a longer amount of time and when we get to that technique portion of this video, that is going to be important. Um, the con would be the price. So you're going to want to pay more for artist grade quality watercolor paper if that is something that you're showing in museums or giving as commissions or gifts. Um, just really high quality art. It's 100% acid free. So when they talk about things like cotton linters. Those have fibers that are still attached to the seed after processing and oftentimes this will be mixed with cotton rag and sometimes it won't specify the difference but you can tell. So cotton rag is sort of feathery and the cotton blend is more uniform. Again the higher the percentage of cotton the better the quality but the more money you will spend. So when we look at arches it says right on here 100% pure cotton and when you go to feel it, it's very fuzzy and textured, and it feels a little, for those of you who want sensory descriptions, if that is something that you like, um, it feels a little uh, fuzzy prickly, okay? There is definitely a texture to it that's fuzzy. So when we look at something else, and this is considered artist quality, this is something that would be considered something like student quality. This is the Fabriano Studio watercolor. Right here it says 25% cotton. So you know what percentage it is. Okay, so this paper is most likely um, wood pulp. You can see that it just says acid free, but there's no mention of cotton anywhere on here. And sometimes it's real easy to tell based on how affordable a watercolor paper pad is. That's one huge indication. So let's talk about wood pulp and cellulose. So wood pulp paper is made from domestic hardwoods like eucalyptus, pine, or cedar, just for an example. And this paper has shorter fibers. Now wood pulp, wood pulp paper that's been treated to remove the linen Linen is sort of a natural glue that repels water that is brought up during the making of this paper process. So if they take the wood pulp paper and they remove the linen and it's acid free, it's then called alpha cellulose. So often people just call it, you know, cellulose paper. So the pros of this paper, it's very, very affordable. It's very available. You could find it in craft stores, hobby stores, not just art stores. It's great for practice. It comes in tons of standard, you know, weights, sizes, textures. Um, so just, you know, sort of to recap this section, 
Cotton paper is great for archival work in museums, commissions, high quality gifts, um, but it's gonna cost you way more. And wood pulp cellulose paper doesn't perform as well and doesn't take a ton of scrubbing with your brush. This, even though there's a texture to this, it's very smooth. You can't feel any of the individual paper fibers. So this is much more affordable. So I hope that helped with talking about watercolor paper ingredients. Okay, I wanna keep talking about paper. I wanna talk about watercolor paper weight. Now the paper weight means the thickness of the individual sheet. It doesn't mean how much a pad of paper actually weighs. So the higher the weight that's on the watercolor paper, the thicker the paper sheet is. So it is measured in pounds and grams per square meter. So you can see on here, this says 640 GM2, or sometimes it says GSM, gram square meter, and 300, 300 pounds. LB is the abbreviation for pound. So, um, I'll give you an example to explain why you only wanna go and look at the gram size when it comes to watercolor paper. This is my best tip for beginners is start now and only look at gram weight when you are purchasing watercolor paper. Ignore pound altogether and I'm gonna tell you why. Just a really tiny brief explanation. So for example, 300 gram paper is always 140 pounds. That is kind of a very average weight that you can always find in art stores. However, 140 pounds is not always 300 grams. And this has to do with the paper weight in the US being weighed. So when they weigh paper in the United States, they use a 500 sheet ream, where it, and it gets kind of confusing. So not all the paper being weighed in the ream is the same size. So one ream of 500 sheets could be 22 by 50, and another one ream of 500 sheets could be 24 by 36. And so it's not an accurate indication of the paper weight. Um, gram weight is determined by measuring one square meter sheet of all types of paper. So across the board, they will measure one square meter of this paper, one square meter of another type of paper, and that is how they come up with grams. So grams is very, very accurate. In fact, I have a small dedicated video to going further in depth of explaining why you only wanna look at grams, and I will link that in the description box if you want to continue on with the research journey. But just know that this is what you want to go by for accuracy. So the benefits of very thick paper the heavier weight, it doesn't buckle or warp under all the water. It can hold more water. Um, it's better for uh, heavy use water techniques. But the cons are the price. So this is probably one of the most expensive watercolor blocks you can purchase um, from many art supply stores because of how thick this paper is. So when you look at this one right here, this is the pretty much the standard. This is the 300 grams right here. And so when we look at the sheet, here is a sheet that is pulled from my block. Super thick. Here is a standard sheet from this pad, it's much thinner. And then the other pad I have right here, and this is probably the most, one of the most budget ones you can buy. This is 190 grams. It's very thin. It's barely thicker than a sheet of um, sort of printer paper. You might even be able to run this watercolor paper through a printer. So that may be one of the benefits of going with the thinner paper. So 
Thinner paper, you know, it's great for your budget. It's great for practicing. It's readily available. Um, some of it, if it's thin enough, you can run it through your printer, like I said. Um, the cons would be, if you're doing heavy watercolor techniques, it's going to buckle and warp. And it might need to be stretched. So, we're not going to talk about stretching in this video too much, but know that you can take a sheet of paper and wet it onto a specific mounted watercolor stretching board and use paper tape and it will hold it really taut and straight as you create. And when you go, you just cut the paper tape all the way around and then you can have your paper be completely flat if you're creating a really unique piece on a very thin sheet of watercolor paper. Now, it's important to note that thick paper doesn't always mean high quality and thin paper doesn't always mean cheap. So you still want to check the cotton percentage. I have some really thin mixed media paper. It is 100% cotton. It is thin, but it's super high quality. So looking at paper, check the cotton, check the grams, check the weight. Okay. I hope this helps for understanding watercolor paper weights. So the next thing I want to talk about is watercolor paper texture. Now there's three basic textures. So there's hot press, cold press, which is also called knot, N-O-T, and rough. So we're going to start with hot press. And basically it's called hot press because it is being pressed through two hot rollers, which gives it the name. And this paper surface is um, has the least amount of texture of the three. I wouldn't say it's always perfectly flat. It depends on which company is making it, but it does have the least amount of texture. So the pros to this paper is it's great for really delicate and subtle details or for reproduction on other smooth paper. So if you like working in miniature and you don't want to deal with the texture, you're going to want something called hot press. Now we look at this one. And this one right here should tell me where it's at. Fine grain, okay, cold pressed right here. So it will either say cold press or it'll say not. This one right here says cold press, okay? And that cold press is probably the most um, popular. So cold press basically got its name because it is pressed through t uh, cold metal rollers. Um, the pros of this is it's really popular. Um, it gives your art a little bit of texture while allowing details. So the paint kind of moves into the little tiny divots and dimples within the page. So there's just a little tiny bit of texture pickup when you go to create, which can be really nice. It's also probably the most readily available in stores. Um, rough watercolor paper is made by pressing the paper between two sheets of felt during the drying stage. So the pros of very heavy texture paper is you get color effects. So if you're into things like granulating watercolor, and I'm probably not going to talk about that in this video, um, it enhances the texture and the consistency of paints if your paints perform differently. So it would be great for really bold, expressive painting techniques. Um, the cons of this is it's just not ideal for detail, small work. I mean, that doesn't mean you can't do really tiny detail work on watercolor, rough, super textured paper. It just means um, that it's going to be a little bit more difficult and it's not going to look exactly the same as it would look on super smooth paper. I think you get what I'm saying. Um, unless that's a stylized choice. So with all of this that I'm talking about, I want you to know that what's best is what's preference for you. So I would say, you know, start with something simple. It doesn't have to be something super expensive. I want you to know that you can start where you're at with what you have. You don't have to rush out and buy the artist grade quality of anything. In fact, Start using what you have if it's student grade. Get used to that. 
figure out how that performs, figure out the benefits of that, the affordability of that while you are practicing and going through drills and doing all the different techniques and things that I'll be discussing later, you're gonna want a lot of paper. In fact, you may wanna use front and back and having something that's a bit more budget can be very, very helpful for that, for creating, okay? Let's talk about the next thing and I'm gonna go right into that. So there are different formats of paper that can be purchased. So as you can see, this is just a pad. It is glued on the top. You want a sheet, you rip it off the glue on the top. Pad is a very form. This is also a pad that's glued on the top. It's a very popular format. As you can see, these two belong to my children. They also paint. This is called a block. And you're gonna see that it's black on the edges. That is the gum right there, that is the glue. At the very top, this is where you can peel it apart and pull sheets out. You have to stick a sharp knife all the way around the edge to break the glue. This kind of stretches it and holds it flat. That is the benefit of a block, but again, you're gonna pay more for that block. Okay, so you can also get spiral bound watercolor sketch pads that just have the spiral on the end. They're very affordable. It comes, a lot of student grade paper comes that way. Um, it does kind of wiggle and move, so just be cognizant of that. There are sketchbooks you can buy. Let me show you one. This one is unique. It is glued in, it is stitched in, and the pages are perforated along the side so you can tear pages out. Depending on the sketchbook, as you can see, it started to crack. But read the reviews in the comment section about how the sketchbook is bound. Is it glued in? Do the pages pop out? Are the pages all stitched in? Do they lay flat? That's going to be really important when you're creating um, to you and your illustrations. Now you can get watercolor paper in huge sheets you can get it in rolls, you can get it in greeting cards, postcards, trading cards, in the round. They make round watercolor sketch, um, sketch pads for creating. Um, and you can get canvas boards and art boards. Um, so the pros and cons of an art board is it's a really nice, great surface. You're gonna pay more for less though. So in the beginning, let's just start with paper. Okay, so Let's talk watercolor sheet sizes. Uh, we're gonna talk Imperial first. Imperial gets its name from um, the sheet name and how many times it is folded. So when you look at a full Imperial, it's 30 inches by 22 inches or 76 by 56 centimeters. A half Imperial is 15 by 22 inches or 56 by 38 centimeters and a quarter imperial is 15 by 11 inches or 38 by 28 centimeters. So that is one standard to watercolor paper. I wanna talk about another one. The other one that you can find that's pretty common when it comes to purchasing sketchbooks and watercolor paper are the A sizes. It'll have the letter A sometimes, or it'll just give the measurements. And this name comes from the ISO 216 International Paper Size Standard. So A3 is 11.7 uh, by 16 and a half inches, or 297 by 420 millimeters. So an A3 is pretty huge. Um, a company I know that makes a nice one would be Moleskin. Um, this is an A4. An A4 is 8.3 by 11.7 inches. An A4 is really close to the standard US letter size of eight and a half by 11 inches. Now an A5, okay, is uh, 5.8 by 8.3 inches. So it is 148 by 210 millimeters. Now an A6, I think I have one of those. Here we go. 
and A6 is, let's see, I have notes, uh, 4.1 by 5.8 inches, so 105 by 148 millimeters. So as the number next to the A gets bigger, the size gets smaller, and every size is halved. It's cut in half. So you take an A4, this is an A4, you cut it in half, you get an A5. You take an A5, you cut it in half, you get an A6. So just remember, as the number gets bigger, the size gets smaller. I know, it can be a little, little tricky. I also have a small dedicated video to understanding paper sizes. I will link that and then I go into B's and C's and all the other things. <laughs> okay, I hope this helped with watercolor paper. Okay, so the next art supply I want to talk about is paint brushes. And I'm gonna discuss all kinds of things. So first I want to tell you the different parts of a paintbrush to help you. So this is called the tip. Um, this whole section is called the head or the tuft. And where it holds the water is called the belly. This metal piece is called the ferrule. And right where you see sort of the indentation lines right here is called the crimp. And this last half is the handle. So these are the parts of a paintbrush. And the tip should always be into a sharp point. If you are working with brushes that um, have that shape, I will show you one that should have a point and doesn't because it is a kind that comes in like Crayola watercolor packs, you can see the difference in the quality. Okay, so the bigger the belly, the more water that it holds and the more fluid and continuous brush stroke you can maintain. So the head right here is held in place by the ferrule and you want this metal collar right here all the way around to be seamless. Now I don't have any examples of any paintbrushes in our house where the metal collar has a seam, but I do have one of these that does this. So this is a very bad paintbrush that has fallen apart, but we're gonna talk about it. So the bristles are all held by the ferrule and the ferrule clamp helps hold the handle and keep moisture and water from getting to the handle. Um, here you can see that the lacquer, this is the, where the glue goes. The glue goes there and then the ferrule goes back on, ideally. Um, what you don't wanna do when you're cleaning, um, so this the end of the handle isn't sealed as you can see and it has glue. So if you store your paintbrushes in like water in a cup, stored down while they're constantly being wet, it actually, water makes wood expand and it's gonna loosen the glue of the ferrule and then your brush is going to fall apart. Now this brush happens to be really, really old, but I like keeping super old, very inexpensive brushes for the purpose of beating up and experimenting with smashing them and creating weird, fun textures. I just like having budget brushes for fun things like that. So let's talk about the different bristle types. The first type I wanna talk about is natural hair brushes. I only own two and it says right on the handles, if I can turn this around, it says squirrel blend quill. So these are made with squirrel hair and a blend of some other things. They might put synthetic with it. Let's talk about that. So natural hair brushes can be made um, with fur from badgers, goats, um, hogs, sables, squirrels, or ponies. Um, the pros to a natural hair brush is that they last longer and they retain their shape. They hold a ton more water because of um, the way natural hairs are, when you look under a hair under a microscope, they're pronged. 
like hairs have little bits to them and the bits help hold the water. So they hold a lot more water um, and so, and pigment and they can release it more evenly. The cons of a natural hairbrush would be that natural hair brushes are byproducts from the meat and fur industry. So ethically, you might not be interested in that. They may not align with your belief system or how you choose to source your products for the environment and for animals. So, um, also, these are handmade. A lot of natural hair brushes are made by hand. You're going to pay more. The con is they're very, very, very expensive. And again, ethically, this may not be for you. Um, synthetic brushes, and I have a couple, couple ones right here. These are fun. Um, synthetic brushes are made from a combination of nylon and polyester. So even ones made um, to mimic natural hair, um, they're really budget friendly. They're made by machine, so that helps keep the price down. They're grateful. All levels of artists can make synthetic hairbrushes, like do whatever they want. I predominantly only work with synthetic brushes. I own two natural hair ones, but I never ever get around to using them. So, um, and these are very, very inexpensive expensive, and they're super affordable and they you can get them to create anything you want them to do. So, and the added bonus of synthetic is you can use them with other types of paint like acrylic. Um, and they don't involve animals. But the one caveat or con to a synthetic brush is you do have to replace it more often. So if, when they start to lose their point or they don't hold as much paint or water. Um, here, let me show you one that's kind of in bad shape. This one is starting to be frayed. It doesn't have its point anymore. Um, if I predominantly use one brush, it'll last me about a year. Um, and that's creating about 100 watercolors to 200 watercolors. So depending on how prolific you are, if you watercolor, you know, three times a week for an entire year, you'll probably want to replace that brush within six months. If you're just using one brush for everything. Um, this here says, imitation sable so this is a fake weasel hair they have synthetic versions that mimic other things it doesn't matter to me personally i these are just so readily available and i can get them to do everything just keep in mind that you never want to store your brushes on the bristles you don't want to store them because they'll get permanently bent and it's really hard to correct that you want to keep and maintain that tip. It's very important. And again, when you're painting, don't store your paint brushes in a water cup upside down. Just lay them flat on like a little towel or whatever you're working with. And that'll keep the water from going up the ferrule and ruining the handle and the glue and everything. You want these to last as long as possible because you're gonna be replacing them a lot anyway. Um, and to clean them, you just need a really mild soap. I have a General's soap that's fine, but if you have skin sensitivity issues and you're really worried about purchasing like art supply cleaners, any type of mild gentle soap, as long as it's made with like veggie oils and has no additives, would be fine for cleaning your brushes. These are the brushes that come with really, really cheap uh, let's see here, Crayola sets, and they just, they don't have a point. They're really hard to work with. They don't hold water. Um, I don't recommend that you use these for creating or painting ever. So buy a little package of synthetics where there's a point involved. All right, let's get to the next section. Okay, now there are many different types of watercolor brushes. I'm, for the purpose of this video, I'll just be concentrating on the two most popular, but know that there are a lot. There's, um, let's see, round, flat, 
Wash, Hake, Mop, Spotter, Rigger, Filbert, Fan, Angle, Cat's Tongue. They come in tons and tons of shapes. So a fan is exactly the shape you would think it is. It's like a holding one of those fans you wave. Um, I don't even own one of those. I only own the things that I use and that comes from years of over-purchasing things and wasting things. So don't be like me. Start where you're at with what you have. Get really, really familiar with it and you will enjoy it more. So the most popular is the round. That's what this is. This is a round and it's very, very versatile. Um, it can be used for washes, broad strokes, fine details, and it comes in a huge variety of sizes. So I just think that the round is wonderful. I do so much work with rounds that I often don't even get to flats, but flat brushes are great for washes and linear strokes, and they can help you get really crisp, straight edges. So you can see where you would want to keep and maintain this really nice and make sure it doesn't turn into something like this where it is all frayed and destroyed. This brush obviously needs to be thrown away, but again, I have some for smashing. But these are the two main brush stroke types. All right, let's talk about brush sizes. Now I am holding these still so we can look at them. This is an eight long round. This is a six flat. Brush stroke, oh, sizes, okay. So it can get a little tiny complicated as each company and manufacturer um, varies from one to the other. But when it comes to like flat and round brushes, the smaller the number, the smaller the brush. So the smallest for rounds, and I might have one here. This one's pretty tiny. Here it is. This one is four zeros, and sometimes it's written four slash zero. This is the smallest one you can get. And it goes all the way up to, so this is one sixty-fourth of an inch, or 0.3 millimeters. And the largest size is a size 24, and that's 11 sixteenths of an inch, or 17.4 millimeters. Now a flat, the smallest size is a zero, and that is one thirty-second of an inch, or 0.8 millimeters. And the largest size for a flat brush is 24, or one inch, or 25.4 millimeters. Um, I, again, they can go bigger, um, but sometimes it changes names. So for flats, it tends to go to size 24. Again, this is very, very small. If you're interested in detail work using an A6 that is hot press, <laughs> this would be ideal. Just know that it's like, you know, maybe 10 bristles. So if you're heavy handed and you're rough with it, it's going to bend and break and fall apart quicker and you'll have to replace it quicker. So you determine how long your supplies last. So care for them and you won't have to replace them quite so often. Okay, that's brushes. All right, let's talk about watercolor paint. Now, most watercolor paint comes in two formats and I'm only gonna talk about two formats since this is beginning watercolor and that is dry pans or wet tubes. Um, so, just know that pans come in all shapes and sizes. These are half pans. There's also a full pan. They al there's also circles. There's a lot of information for that. Um, the pros of pans would be that these are super convenient. It's very portable, great for travel, um, and compact. Very compact, lightweight. This is great for beginners. Um, Pans come in student grade or artist grade, so you can get them in a wide range of prices. And um, you can get a lot of colors in a little tiny space. So this is just great for moving around. Um, the cons to pans uh, would be that these are considered sort of to be less vibrant. Um, the colors can be less bold, 
and the pans you get are limited to the set that you buy. So just know that when you are looking at prices. Um, talking about tubes, tubes can be very, very convenient. Um, you can pour these into empty pans and create your own set and still have some left over. There's a huge quantity that comes in the tube. Um, it's great if you have mold or humidity issues that might take place in pans. Tubes can solve that problem. Um, the cons to tubes is they're more work. There's more prep time. You might feel like you're wasting some if you squeeze out too much. Um, cheaper colors, cheaper series numbers per tube can be kind of limiting depending on the company. Um, you know, that's... But you can create custom palettes if you want to. So what's best is what's preference for you when you're starting out. Like this set was $20. This is a Winsor Newton Cotman. Um, it's like, a, it's just very, very affordable. And these tubes vary in price depending on series number and company and grade of quality. Now I have a whole video dedicated to series number, but that is definitely much more intermediate. Just know that within one company, like Daniel Smith, for example, different tubes are gonna cost different prices, even though they're the same size. And that has to do with the pigment inside. And if you're like, what is pigment? Pigment is the natural color matter that is made from animal or plant tissue. So sometimes a tube can cost more if it's hard to get that pigment, or the tube could cost more if it's really hard to make that paint. Some paints take more work to make. So let's get into this. Um, we need to talk about safety a little bit because it's very, very important. Um, we need to talk about toxicity labeling. So there is a standard practice for labeling. There is the Art Materials for Health Hazards and the American Society for Testing and Materials. So when you look on a tube and you flip it over, and I have a variety of tubes here because some make it more obvious than others. Let me find a really good example. This tube right here says AP in the biggest letters. AP stands for approved product. So, and it says ACMI above it, much smaller. That means Art and Creative Materials Institute. AP means it's approved. It means it's safe. Um, if you're looking at your tube and there's a circle and it says CL, that means cautionary labeling. It's not hazardous, but you should never give it to kids 11 years old or younger. So when you are painting and creating and looking at your tubes, different tubes will be labeled differently. And let me find it here. This says conforms to ASDM. That means it's safe. So it may not have the circle, it just says it conforms. And conforms means safe. This one has a little sticker. That's what Marimu does on some of their products. Um, this one right here, let's see. Um, this says conforms to ASDM, but it says keep out of reach of children. And I live in the United States. I live in California. We have proposition, what's called proposition 65. And under that, if this has anything in it that can lead to causing cancer, they have to put an additional warning label on it because of where I live. So, Viridian. <laughs> and all of them have it listed in different locations. Um, confirms to the ASTM. It's really, really, really small. You'll have to really root around and read every single word, every single sentence on your product 
conforms to ASDM. It's very, very small. It's the last line here. It's gonna be in a different location depending on what company has made the tube and how they choose to label it, but they have to put that on there if it is safe or if it is hazardous to small children. And know that when you are creating, um, make sure that if you're working with hazardous paints that you are cognizant of what you're wearing, what you're doing, um, small children and animals. Okay. All right, let's talk watercolor palettes. So watercolor palettes come in tons of different options. There's plastic, metal, porcelain, ceramic. Um, whatever you have is best for you. Like this set of Schmincke, this is the lid. The lid is meant to be the palette for this set. And you can even use the bottom. It has little tiny indentations for tiny wells. The wells is what holds the water and the pigment of your paint. Again, this is the Cotman. The lid is the palette. Here is a plastic $1, one US dollar palette or less. It's probably 66 cents. That is great for mixing. Here is a porcelain palette. Porcelain is the best for watercolor. This is a heavier one. Um, know that you can use, you know, a plate from like a thrift store or something. We'll get into that. Here is a package where you can buy core paints and in the package, the lid has dents because the lids become the wells for color mixing. So there's tons of different options when it comes to using and creating with palettes. Know that plastic can bead up. What I do to keep, when I first get a plastic palette is I use a toothbrush with toothpaste and I scrub the wells and that keeps the paint from beading and it helps it mix easier. Um, if you are using a dish or a plate, uh, like from your kitchen, let's say you have, you know, ceramic or a porcelain plate that makes it really, really easy to use as a palette. It should then be dedicated to your art and should not be put back into the cupboard. So the same with using like a dedicated cup or mug um, or jar for your watercolor water when you're cleaning and mixing. You don't want to put that back into your cupboard just for safety and toxicity reasons. Um, if you avoid eating and drinking while you're painting, you'll never accidentally drink your watercolor water. Um, I have to say this <laughs> because it's super common. The amount of artists I know that have accidentally almost or have taken a sip of their watercolor water is really, really alarming high. Um, don't do it. Please, please, please be careful. Also, if you are handling paints that are CL um, or have, you know, ingredients that may be more toxic, a lot of people worry about cadmiums. Um, if you handle those often, you may want to start doing gloves. You might want to wear a smock. I wear a really old sweatshirt for all my videos and this is my form of smock now. This is sort of dedicated to my art, which is why this, my sleeves are kind of the same in all my videos now. Um, just because it protects all my clothes and I never know when I'm going to change mediums and make a mess in and outside and around my videos. So be really, really careful um, when you are working with all your products that you don't get yourself sick, you don't get children sick, you don't get your pets sick. This is just a really fun, great art medium to create in, but you wanna keep it as safe as possible for everyone around you, including yourself. So, I have given you all the supply info pertinent to being and doing beginning watercolor. It is now your choice what you do with it. So what's best is what's preference to you, your life, your budget, your time, your interests, your goals, and what you already own. You don't have to rush out and buy tons and tons of things. If you own one or two things, let's work with those one or two things. Get to know those products. Use those products every single day for a month. 
Figure out the pros and cons of those. Just use what you have and that'll be perfect and great. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about is just a little tiny bit of watercolor history because I think history is absolutely fascinating as it pertains to the art world and I think you might too. So we're just gonna do a little brief thing of watercolor. So this art form dates back to the ancient Egyptians and they used watercolor on papyrus, which is sort of a reed plant that grows by marshy areas near the Nile River. And their paint was sort of dug from the earth or found from minerals that were gathered and mixed with some sort of binder, probably something like gum Arabic. But their paintings were symbolic and regulated um, and their palette relied on six colors. So they used red, green, blue, yellow, white, and black. The paintings were found in tombs and temples, and they painted on all kinds of things, not just papyrus. So they did walls and tombs and different objects. But my favorite little fact about the art history of ancient Egypt is that they had to make their own blue. So it wasn't a naturally occurring color that they could find and use. And they came up with their own little blue formula and what they did was they took sand, lime, sodium carbonate, and copper compound and mixed it with fire. You have to heat it up and get it really, really hot. And that was their Egyptian blue. And I find that absolutely amazing and fascinating. Um, I will pop up some photos as I'm talking about this, but I just, the history of watercolor is so rich. I will link a bunch of different articles in the description box if you want to fall down that hole, that rabbit hole, and keep reading and researching. I just wanted to share that little tidbit with you because I just, just amazing. All right, let's move on to the next section. So this is sort of my standard watercolor setup for beginners. I have the brushes I'm gonna use. I have a round and a flat. I have a little tiny towel. This towel is obviously dedicated to my art supplies of watercolor. And I use this for wiping off a little bit of excess water in case I get <laughs> a little excited and my brush is dripping and it's just too wet for what I need to be doing. I can kind of tap that. And then if I am switching between brushes, I can set them down horizontally while I'm creating without leaving them standing in water so the water doesn't ruin the brush. Here I have a pan set up. Here is the pan I would use and the palette. Here is just a plate that is dedicated to painting and art supplies. And here are a couple tubes. Now I have what you see is two cups of water. Um, one is just for cleaning my brush. This one is a collapsible, foldable, it's rubber, it has scalloped edges. If I want to put a brush there, it won't roll away or fall off. It's not necessary. Um, it's great for travel if that is something you want to get into. I mean, there's other options for travel. This one clips onto sketchbooks and has two wells. But you, in beginning, when you're starting, one cup to clean your brush one cup just to wet your brush. So this is how I set this up and my paper is lightly taped to my desk just so it doesn't wiggle around but you can figure out how to adhere your paper. Maybe it's already in a bound pad but this is just the standard beginning setup that I like to have. Okay I am going to now zoom in so we can get started on watercolor techniques. Okay, let's get started. I'm going to squeeze out some paint onto the plate I'm using as a palette. This is a very dark green. This is the Prussian green. We can talk about this in depth in intermediate watercolor. And this is Potter's Pink. And we can talk about this version of Potter's Pink in intermediate watercolor. But I'm going to be using these two and then I also have pans. Now, you'll have to find a way to wet your pans. Some people have a little mister, or a little eyedropper, or a little pipette, or you can take a big brush 
fill it, dip it in the water, and then drip paint on the areas you want to wet. And what you're doing is you are activating the watercolor. You're getting it ready for use. You want to pre-wet that. And any way you see how to do that is best. Pipettes work. I have this little squeegee that holds up to an ounce of water. This also works for dropping in. There's tons and tons of different ways to do it. Um, no gatekeeping. I'll link things. Um, any way you go to do it is the right way for you. Okay? Don't ever let anybody tell you that you're doing things wrong if what you're doing works for you and it makes you happy. Okay? So we are going to now work on techniques and I'm going to do some terminologies with you because we are going to need those terminologies later for future videos. All right, and this is pretty clear to see. So the basic techniques for watercolor are wet on wet. And what that means is a really wet Stroke, this is a lizard and crimson. This is a red, this is a very cool red. It is very, very wet. There's a lot of water involved. In fact, I am gonna zoom in even more. Okay, we are now zoomed in. I want you to see how absolutely wet this is. This is a ton of water on this page. And what you're going to do, let me clean my brush. Then I'm gonna use my towel to sort of drip off some of the excess. I'm now gonna reach into another color. I'm gonna reach into the yellow that is within this set, and I'm just going to touch it into this water. What happens when you add wet water with pigment to already wet water with pigment on your page is you get a sort of bloom effect. Now you can just add a ton of water, let me move that so there's no shadow, a huge chunk of water onto the paper just to see what I mean. You can do wet on wet and one can just be clear liquid and just a drop of pigment. Now some brands and companies bloom out more when the pigment touches the water. Um, Core, for example, is one if you really are interested in this type of effect. Um, if you were doing certain types of botanicals or abstracts, that would be something to later experiment. Again, just start with what you have. I'm just using a simple round brush and I am using some Winsor Newton Cotman. It doesn't have to be super expensive. You're just learning how to do this and just experiment and get weird. Practice pulling out the water and doing little tiny strokes. See how thin a line you can use your brush. What is the limitations and the expectations of this brush? Can it do thin lines? Can it do thick lines? Can it create different shapes? What happens when you touch down? What does that look like with your brush? This is beginning watercolor. You want to experiment and see what your brush is capable of creating. Is it capable of creating shapes? This shape to me looks like a leaf. It looks like a flower petal. So I believe that if I went around in rotation with this shape, I could create some sort of star or flower. I can create shapes with this brush. It's, this is how beginning watercolor looks. It is practice. Can I do stripes? Can I do clean lines? Can I keep within a stylized shape? Now, so this is just wet on wet. Again, I'm using my towel to sort of clean off a little bit of excess. I wanna grab another color. I'm gonna grab my green from over here because this will be very visible. And just practice adding color and seeing what that looks like and seeing if you can sort of tease colors out, 
pull colors apart and start to manipulate and learn how to control the color with the brush. Again, this is a very wet on wet technique. I am using 300 gram watercolor paper. Whatever you have that works for you works. Try pulling the color back up. Try pulling the second color back down. Experiment. This is what this is all about. This is how you learn how to watercolor. This is it. And then look at some of the ones that start to dry and see how you can pull and blend. Pull and blend and just practice that. Can you blend a color into another color? These are very important techniques when later creating. Even if you're working monochromatically, having smooth strokes, not having visible lines. Here you can see this is cold pressed paper. You can see the slight texture, the dimple of the pigment sitting in all the little dimples here. It's very easy to see. I want to show you a second technique. This is going to be wet on dry. So we need to create some shapes and some surface area that we can then let dry. I think this is really pale, so I'm gonna add a little bit more pigment into it. And I am just practicing bouncing my brush, dragging my brush, moving the pigment around. You want to get really, really comfortable using a brush. Just like learning to write and you learning to um, do calligraphy or cursive or however you learned, holding a pencil, holding your brush, getting used to that, strengthening the hand muscles that do that that learn how to do that, learning an instrument, muscle memory. You want to get very comfortable with your brush, with the paints, with practicing. Let's add some more colors here for different layers, layer options. We can do one that's more opaque. See, this has hardly any water on it. So we're gonna get a really dark color here, okay? And then we're going to wait for these to dry. And when they dry, we're then going to add a wet layer to them. These two are completely dry. This one is drying. It is still a little wet. We're going to experiment with this one, but we're going to start with these two. So dry on wet. Now I have some color already in this palette. I'm going to add a little bit of water and rehydrate that. not the most fun color in the world so let's add a little bit more pink to this one let's loosen that one up here there we go now when we talk about opacity some watercolors are naturally more opaque some are transparent, some are semi-transparent. It says on the tubes, it says on the pans, it says on the web pages when you look up each individual color, what it is. Some can be really thinned out, and the more you thin it, the more transparent it becomes. So if you're doing layers and you wanna see all the layers, you really want to add a ton of water and really, really thin that out. I'm just bringing some water over from my cup. And then when I go to paint over a layer that's dry, this is dry, you can see both colors, okay? This is a fairly transparent layer. Now if I did a opaque layer where it's thicker, the wet on dry is lost because you can hardly see the layer underneath it, okay? So you kind of want thinner layers so you can see what's underneath, especially if you are doing dark over light. If you're doing light over dark, let us me show you that one. So here's my darker color. Make sure my brush is really clean. I have a pale yellow that I want to add a little bit more water to. This is what I'm going to use. 
Now, here's a very pale yellow. It is picking up and re-wetting the color underneath it. So depending on how much water you use, how long you work, how long you scrub, how much you touch these two layers, it can lift. Okay? So these are the types of things that need to be practiced when working on techniques how much paint you have, how much water's in your bristles, in the tuft, in the belly here, how long this has been drying, how you want to layer. Because what you can do is you can paint a layer, and I'm just doing, you know, some sort of semicircle situation, and you can do one that's a little drier with a little less water. Okay, this is the wet layer, this is the semi-wet layer. So this is semi-wet. If I now take a color, and what I mean is semi-wet is my brush, brush is predominantly dry. It's not dripping, it's not le leaking. I can then add paint over this. This is what you want to practice. So if you add something that's very, very wet onto something semi-wet, starts to lift. Maybe you want to lift. Maybe you don't want these harsh square lines. So you want to try and smooth that out. This is what the practice looks like. Wet on dry. You can pull. You can pull color <laughs> into other color. Just keep, this is what the practicing is. It is experimenting, it is trying all matters of movement with the brush you have. Here, let's switch to the flat brush just for fun. What are the limitations? What are the strengths with these brushes? Can I then stick this in a color? Let me get some water here for my plate and create, what kind of lines can I create? How thin can this go? How thick can this go? Now, this may look like a bunch of garbled mess, but this is information. This is all telling you different things. And while you are practicing these techniques, I want you to do a couple things. You can either do it on this page or you can do it in a separate notebook, and that's make notes. Tons and tons of notes. If you accidentally mix a couple colors and you really like it or you really hate it, write it down what you did and how you felt about it. Write down the date. You can put that on this page. You can put all the information that is pertinent, adding a layer on top of a layer, wet on dry, wet on wet, what that looks like, how you feel about it, what you think of your brushes, what your brush is capable of doing, how long you worked. Oh, today I just practiced for 10 minutes. Guess what, that's, those 10 minutes adds up. If you do that every day, that's gonna add up really, really quickly. So what do you do with all of this? This can be cut and collaged with your notes. This can be cut into bookmarks you can use and date. Keep these, keep a couple sheets of these, keep these as notes and ideas and practice pages. Let's move on to another technique. I want to talk about gradients. Gradients is where you take a color and you blend it into another color. So I'm going to take my tube paint. For those of you working with tubes, I'm gonna add way more color or a way more water to the pigment. And I'm gonna to start to create a line on my page. Now what I wanna do is I wanna make sure, and I kind of tilt my paper a little bit. 
I want to make sure that the water is beading and pooling at the bottom. If it's beading and pooling at the bottom, I can then grab another color and keep working and add that to that color and create really unique gradients. Blending from one color into another color. How seamless did you want that? How dry did you want that? Maybe you are moving into something that is much drier. When you first start with gradients, it can be really, really helpful to um, use more water so it is more seamless. So I'm gonna use a little bit bigger brush. No, nope. I'll keep with what I have because that's what we're doing. I have to stop using my granulating watercolor. It's getting wonky. Um, Let's do the red. Let me add a little bit more water to it. So here's a red and you can see the water. You can see the water, you can see the little pools here along the bottom. You can even pull, you can pull down. You can angle your page up, that's what I'm doing. I have my page at like a 40 degree angle and I'm gonna add some yellow. Now I'm gonna touch it to that pool and I'm going to start to bring that down. I'm adding yellow to red. Bring it down. With gradients, you don't want harsh lines unless you do. So everything is a rule until it's not, and it's your stylistic choice. It is your creative voice for how you create. Creating gradients bleeding colors into other colors. Now it doesn't have to be so clean and straight. There are many different ways to create art. There are no hard fast rules. So if this is my red that I am creating with and painting with, and this is, I'm just gonna create a really huge chunk here. And all I'm doing is just practicing and trying different things. I should move my plate. Okay. I don't use this one so much um, in my watercolors because of my subject matter. I don't do a lot of backgrounds, but here is my gradient. So what we're next going to practice is building up color. Grab the paint you have. We are going to practice that concept. Here is a heart. I'm just going to add more water. And I'm gonna to have to decide how much water I want on here. If there's excess water, you can pick it up with your brush. You can dab it. If you don't want the hard lines, you can blend in those hard lines into your shape. We are losing our heart here, aren't we? While it's wet, you can manipulate it. You can move it around. And that's what you want to practice doing. Now, we're gonna get in different concentrations to build up color. Let's, a little darker. This heart, and again, this is wet on wet, so it's gonna feather out, it's gonna bloom. You want to practice layering, adding pigment, smoothing the pigment out, trying different strokes on different levels of wetnesses. This can then become feathers. You want to practice adding more pigment on top of pale pigment and building up this color and making it darker and darker and darker. These are techniques that you need when painting and creating. So 
So you have the light, you have some medium, you have some very, very dark. The dark is just paint that hasn't been saturated with water. So it's virtually from the tube. It's very thick, very dark. When I say the comment of value, we can look at a range. This is again Prussian green. When we look at the value range of Prussian green, and I pull this color out, Prussian green has a really, really huge value range. It can be very dark, it could be um, sort of middle grade color, and it can be very, very pale. So these are some of the terminologies you're going to want to learn. And when you look at color, dark colors have a large, larger value range and you can create a wider mixture of different blends and colors with that because of that. So these are all the techniques you want to work on and experiment, gradients, layers, wet on wet, dry on wet. Um, what you can do is practice within shapes. So if you create a circle and you want to pre practice sort of blending and creating a value range within a circle, you can then do that, wet your brush, clean all the pigment out of it, and then just add water to that shape and move the color around and experiment. You can always lift some pigment and keep experimenting with what you're doing and try different textures and different strokes. These are all things that you can use within watercolors. So when you're practicing these for drills, the other thing you can do is you can do things like silhouettes are really, really fun. So just think big circle, sort of tiny circle here. Triangle, triangle, tail, cat silhouettes. And you can practice adding different colors in there, working on shadow and light. Maybe you see the whiskers out the side. You can practice with silhouette shapes within all these different strengths. There is a bird flying. Practice using your brush, seeing its strength and its weaknesses. The other thing you can do is you can just practice blending and having multiple colors on your brush and doing strokes. Seeing what you like, what you don't like. These can be um, then created, swatch all the colors you have. Swatch and make little swatch cards. I wanna show you some swatch cards. Um, with my artist grade set, it came with a booklet. And what I did was I daubed real dark and real light. So I could see the darkest color and the lightest color that these can make within the swatch card. Pans look different than how they dry on paint. Same with tubes. This is one I made with watercolor paper. I used a Micron pen. Micron pens um, are not water soluble. And I wrote all the names. And then I pulled from dark to light so I can see the value range within the colors. Make swatch cards for all your paints. It is so, so, so helpful and you will be so glad you did. So, um, the other questions, questions I get asked, what do you do with your watercolor water when you're done? Um, you can dump it down the sink if there are no chunks. Some watercolor paint have minerals that are good with plants. You can water plants with it. Um, it's not like acrylic. You don't want acrylic paint to go down your sink. So 
If you're just doing little things and it's very thin and there aren't globs and chunks, you'll be fine putting this down your drain. Um, the next question I get asked is for this right here, like how long do you leave your paint on a palette? And I, because you can just keep re-wetting your watercolor. I leave paint on my palette for up to six months. The second I start to re-wet this and it doesn't smooth out and it starts getting chunky, I know the paint has sat here for too long and I can't reuse it. So I do leave paint on my palettes for months so I can use them up and not waste any. Yeah, so make tons and tons of notes. Write what you like, what you don't like, the techniques you've used, the colors you've used or mixed because you're just starting out. So learning to color mix is going to be um, a sort of a steep learning curve here and brushes for the strokes. Okay, so before we start practice drills, I want to show you a watercolor I did. Now this is an A4 size. This is um, by Etcher. It is hot press, it's very smooth surface. This watercolor picture, which is from the palm of my hand, took me three and a half hours. Now here you can see the buildup and the importance of layers. So the palest layer would be the skin, and then an, a secondary layer with a little bit more pigment becomes the drop shadow on the finger, as well as the lines for the knuckles, layer for the shadow for the inside of the hand that's not receiving light, wearing a dark shirt, dark lines that fade out, that gradiate out, look like real creases and cuts within this leather bound book. This is based on the movie Hocus Pocus, which is a Halloween movie. Um, and then lots and lots and lots and lots of textured layers and sort of experimenting with brush strokes. And in doing this, I would work on an area, wait for it to dry while I work on another area and then go back to that area. And this is a lot of fairly dry strokes, fairly dry paint being laid down, and then dry on top of it. So none of this is wet on wet. If you want crisp, clean lines, you have to do drier paint on dry layers. So building up layers for watercolor is vital. It's how you get shadow, it's how you create realism. Middle value tones, dark value, this is all indigo watercolor. It's one color monochromatically. It has a huge value range of dark to light. And within that color, you can create textures. I have splotches. I have little polka dot stipples. I have little stripes and striations. I have so many textures. I want to show you up close. When working on watercolor, keep adding and building up the layers to create realism. This eye is just done with gradation of value of the watercolor. It's lighter here, it's shaded darker there. It adds a sense of realism, okay? So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna work on drills that create and add realism. Again, um, I can show you another one. This is a skull I painted. Let me move some things out of the way here. Building up color in sections creates the shadow and the divots and makes it more lifelike. That's all this is, is just different concentrations of the pigment color laid down and some are layers on top of each other to get darker value to denote shadow and light, okay? Okay, so grab a clean sheet of watercolor paper and we are going to do some drills and I am going to show you the best way to work on these techniques that I have been discussing. And you're just going to create a sheet, make sure there's plenty of water on your palette for adding more wet and having dry. So 
A really easy way and fun way to do this mm. is a circle. Now I have more paint on one tip than the other. If I want it to be all one color, I'm going to have to go back in and make sure that this is blended out while it's still wet. If I wait till it's dry, I'm going to get hard lines. So this needs to be done when it's wet. Make sure when you watercolor, you don't have anything pressing. You're not expecting a phone call in five minutes, a neighbor to come over. Um, you're not super stressed. This is a very relaxing thing. Go slow, go gentle, be kind to yourself, be very, very patient. So after your circles, and you can practice, um, you can either go down or you can go across. So you can do circle, and then practice how thin you can get your lines. You can also add pressure. You can vary the pressure within one line. Thin, thick, thin. And then I want you to do a very, very wet, very, very wet square with lots and lots of water. And you're going to practice your gradients in the squares, layering in the circles, and fine lines in between. And you're going to fill a whole page with this. creating different styles and types of gradients. How you want to mix, add them in, how abstract you want them to look. Again, have a towel. If you have too much moisture, you can clean your brush, you can dry it off. Figure out how you want to do your stylized gradients when mixing it two colors. Again, I am using a very granulating color with the green, so that's probably not helping me. But, and then another circle. Okay. And then you want to practice thin lines. Practice using the brush in different ways to see what it is capable of. And then another square. To create a gradient, make sure the bottom's wet. You don't want hard lines. Then adding in another color. Figure out how you want to transition one color into another color. Let me get a different tube of paint that isn't quite so granulating. Now let's use my palette. We'll do palette for the next row, okay? So if you're working with a palette, really fine lines. See this paintbrush is really, really wet. So the wetter your paintbrush is, the harder it is to get those really, really fine lines because the water is going to bump up. So. Dry a little bit off and I will zoom in for the next row so you can see up close. I just want to show you zoomed out what this is going to start looking like. So here's my square. I'm creating my gradient. Look how bright that color is. Isn't that pretty? We're going to start adding in green. And if there's any excess, wipe off the tip of your brush and you can just grab and pull it off. Gradiate the red into another color. Circle. And again, you can have part of it be really light, part of it be really dark, or all one color, one solid color. Practice your brush strokes. Now this brush is really, really dry. So I'll be able to get finer lines and see the different brush stroke techniques you can get. And then we're going to go back to another gradient. The importance of layering, the importance of building up gradients and putting color combinations together 
is very, very crucial. So you wanna do this before it dries. Again, I'm holding my page up so you can see it bead, all the water bead at the bottom. I'm gonna grab some green. There's still a lot of red in that brush, okay. I'm gonna grab it and I'm gonna pull down. I'm gonna pull down. And figure out how to work your gradients and how you want those to look. Now I'm gonna zoom in and show you. Okay, here I am zoomed in. Here's my palette. I wanna make sure you can see all the different things I'm using. Here's my towel. I'm gonna create a circle. Again, we're gonna do layering, gradients, and strokes. So this is pretty wet. I'm gonna add more pigment to this. Make sure it's even color all around. While it's still wet, I can kind of move. You can kind of move the pigment around. While that's drying, we are going to practice strokes. How thin can you draw lines with the brush you have? Again, I am using a six long round. You wanna try big fat strokes. You wanna try thin strokes. You want to alternate between the two. A line that starts thin, gets heavy, gets thin, gets heavy. This is how you get to know the capabilities of your brush, what it can do, what it can't do, being able to do lines, and then experiment with having too much water, having your brush be drier, having it be wetter, see what that looks like, and then add notes. Dry brush, too much water, good job solid color. Congratulate yourself when you do a thing that you really like. If you feel like you've done a good job somewhere, put that in the notes. Also note, a lizard and crimson, Prussian green. You know, this is what it looks like blending together. Now let's do a gradient. You're gonna wanna do these drills with a bunch of your paints because all your paints are gonna act just a little bit different. Again, some will be more opaque, some will be more transparent, some will be semi-transparent, and you just kind of want to get to know how they act, how they perform. There's differences within companies, within grades, so student grade versus artist grade, and then within each color and pigment, they're going to act a little bit different. And you can see here, this solid color, this is tons and tons of water here. Now I am going to grab I'm cleaning my brush. I have my towel. I'm gonna to grab green pigment. I'm gonna grab a lot. And I'm gonna come down. And I'm gonna grab that. And if I don't like, if I don't think that's a seamless enough blend between the two colors, I clean my brush. I'm gonna wipe a little bit off, a little bit of the excess. And I can go back in and I can Touch it. I can move the pigment around a little bit. While it's wet, you can still mess with it. It's gonna lift a little bit of the red pigment. But again, this is what experimentation looks like. Maybe you don't want that dark of a green, so you're gonna lift it off your brush. You're just gonna lift it off. Now some colors are very staining. Some can be, um, some can't be lifted at all. You see, there's a lot of water here. I'm gonna move that water back around. And then we're gonna do another circle. Now, I'm gonna try this with a drier brush. And this is what the practice is. It's getting to know how wet you need your brush, how dry you need your brush. You will get a feel for it. This brush is so dry. Lots and lots of little strokes. but all the same value and color, okay? How much paint your brush can hold before you need to reload it and add more. It's all practice. It's practice, practice, practice. And because this brush is so incredibly dry, I'm gonna be able to get really, really fine lines and try really unique things. And you're gonna to wanna to fill the entire page. Fill the entire page. 
You're gonna wanna do this multiple pages, multiple paints, multiple days. And then what you're gonna do is once you fill the whole page, once the bottom's filled, you're gonna come back around and you're gonna start at the top again. But what you don't wanna do is put your hand through the paint that's wet or carry it over. So flip your page around. Now you're gonna begin again with these dry circles and work on layering. So let's get close up for that. Okay, so here was the first circle I painted. Now it's in the bottom right hand corner of my page. So I'm not dragging my hand through my paint or doing anything like that. What I'm gonna do is practice building up color. So I'm gonna take my palette and I'm gonna take my paint and I'm gonna add lines across, shapes across. I could do little tiny hearts you want to practice layering color on top of color. So let's take some of the alizarin crimson, this very cool red. And I have videos on color theory in a playlist if you are interested. Layering. Now we can thin out the red. We can turn this into a gradient. We can add things to this and keep experimenting. But that is what these circles are for. The circles are now dry. So you can now get weird with it. And that's the whole point of watercolor is experimenting and see what you like, see what you enjoy and get what you're doing is not only are you practicing techniques, but you're building creator confidence to keep going and to experiment and try new things. And the more confident you get with creating, the more you're going to create and the more challenging your subject matter is going to become within your creations. I wanna thin this out a little bit. So that is what I'm doing on my plate. I'm taking it and I am just adding more water. I'm making it thinner. I wanna do a really thin wash so it's almost pink. And if it's too pale, add a little bit more pigment and build it up. Now that's really wet. It might lift the color underneath that, but this is what the practice is for. The practice is for this. How wet does my brush have to be? How dry does it have to be? What layers best over what? What order do I like that in? What does that look like? You can practice shapes, squares, hearts, triangles, whatever is easiest for you. Um, if the heart is a little too challenging, skip it. If it's stressing you out, don't do it. If that's not adding any value, keep adding pigment and building up the color. You want to see a full value range to create shadow and highlight. This would be the highlight. This would be the shadow. Highlight on the right, shadow on the left. Middle value in the middle. If you are doing a gradient and you want one color to fade into another, again, I am just lifting with my brush. You can also pull out the highlight with more water. gradient of one color and keep messing with it. Keep experimenting with it. Keep trying things. If you want to try a gradient on top of a gradient, keep going, keep working because all these tools and techniques are going to be needed for the tutorial. So let's get started on that. Okay. So for today's watercolor tutorial, we're going to do a bird. Birds are a very fun thing to watercolor as they come in all colors, all shapes, all sizes, they're really fun to stylize. I'm gonna show you how we're gonna do this. So first I'm just going to draw the shapes we're going to be creating so you can identify. Forewarned is forearmed. So the bird we're going to draw, or watercolor, it's going to be an oval shape, an upside down teardrop, to the side 
kind of an upside down heart. Little triangle. And then there's going to be some leg, okay? And one leg will be a little bit longer than the other. Now your bird can have a smaller oval. It can have a more robust teardrop. It can have a longer heart shape, tail. It can have a bigger beak. Both of these are fine. It can also just have the one leg that you see, okay? This is the shape we're going to stick to when we do the watercolor tutorial. You're going to want two colors, and then if you want to do black for the eye, that is an option open to you. So, let's get started. If you want to have this on your page for reference, you can draw it right next to it. You can make notes. You could um, even use a water soluble pen. So when you add water, you can kind of see what that's gonna look like to help better visualize the bird if you want. This was a Tombow pen for reference in case you're curious. Let's get started. So I am going back to my round brush and I am going to start with the head. Remember, it's going to be an oval that's sideways. So I want, you can do a medium value, you can do a dark value, you can do a light value. But keep in mind this is going to be oval shaped. So we're going to color sort of the top half, but you wanna leave a little bump out for the eyeball, okay? We will come back to it. This is the top half of the bird. I have a bunch of water. This is still wet. Now birds have feathers which are kind of pointy. So if you add little tiny strokes, let me zoom in. All right. If you add little tiny points to the bottom like I'm doing, you don't want such a hard straight line. Now you're going to want to fill this in with your pigment, this shape, this half oval here. Okay. And if you want to bring the shape into the triangle for the beak, you absolutely can. Bring that pigment, okay? This is the top half of our bird. Now this is a lot of water. This is going to need to dry. So what we're going to do is we're going to come to this section right here, second, and we're gonna color this section second. This is the bottom half of the teardrop. So just know that there is an imaginary, there's an imaginary line right here that makes this the oval, okay? It's very pale and faint. You don't have to draw this if you don't want to, but for visualization, that's what that is. Now I kinda of want a drier brush. So what I can do is I can blot if there's a ton of extra water, I can blot it. Go back in. I can go back in with a higher strength that isn't so watered down on my palette. And I can start with the bottom portion. And it's gonna come around a little bit halfway. And again, it's up to you how you stylize your bird. I kind of want them to come up. I want this to be really feathery and have little lines. It adds distinction and texture, like a visual interest. We're going to take more of this color and we are going to come down and we are going to finish that line that makes the teardrop. Okay. Figure out how big you want your teardrop to be. Add your color accordingly. Again, I'm going really light, like I'm sort of tracing this with pencil, but I'm doing it with watercolor, and then I am adding the darker pigment on top. Always an option. 
Okay, this is the bottom portion of my bird. Now, we know that this is going to sort of come around here for the teardrop. You don't have to draw this line, I just want to show you. And we're going to do a real dark tail feathers, okay? It's the bottom part of the heart, but you don't need the base. So imagine you're cutting a heart, the base of the heart off. See how I'm just sort of drawing? I'm just very using the tip of my brush and drawing that shape. And then I'm feeling that shape in, okay? So now we have some visual interest. Now you can come in with a second color and we can start adding a second color or you can do this monochromatically. I think monochromatic might be the easiest. So what I'm gonna do is I want the lightest color of this green. I'm gonna clean my brush. I'm gonna add a lot of water to my palette. I want a really, really pale, pale green. Again, you can use a second color, you can use one color, and we're gonna come in and we're gonna kinda of pull. We're gonna pull a little bit of color. We want to add a little bit of shadow. It's okay if it touches. I know it's still wet, that's okay. This isn't hyper realism. Again, this is beginning watercolor. So just add a little bit, come in, some visual interest with your bird. Now this is still really wet, so if you want to do wet on wet and touch that and have it come out and bloom, you can get some really nice bloom effects within your bird. Okay, and then you want to do a little bit of the stomach region. Again, you don't have to have this really hard line here. I just wanted to show you and come in with really, really pale or another color. And you're just gonna come in to the stomach area and just color it the way you want to see it. But what you wanna do is you wanna leave a little tiny bit of exposed page in the stomach and in the face. So figure out, I added some more water without pigment to sort of blend it out a little bit gentler and you can squeegee your brush, add a little bit of water, and create sort of different textures and colors within your bird. Now, your bird needs a little bit of a leg, but this is really, really wet. So if I go to touch this, it's going to bloom. But I'm using the same color, so it's fine. If you're not using the same color and this is wet, you have two options. One, you could dry it, hair dryer, craft dryer, fan. Or you can take a brush and you can lift the excess water off. So it's a drier region. We're just gonna do a little leg. Remember we've been practicing strokes. You come down and then they have little feet. I'm doing little three and I'm doing a little leg. Okay, there is my bird's leg. Here is my bird. I kind of want a little bit more blending here for visual interest. So I'm just adding little polka dots on the wet just to make it a little bit more visually interesting. Maybe your bird has polka dots, maybe it has stripes. Now, your bird is not floating in space. So what you're gonna to wanna to do, you're gonna want a drier brush. You're not gonna want this wet, you're not gonna want this dripping. Figure out the look and feel of the belly, how much it's loaded with pigment, with watercolor. And you're just gonna start at the top of your page. We're gonna come down at an angle, you ready? And it's gonna be varying widths, varying strengths, varying colors, and this is the branch. Your bird is not floating into space. It is on a branch of a tree, and you can just keep coming down. The thing that's fun about branches is they don't have to be the same thickness, and they don't have to be the same color throughout. So you can go back in. I did a really pale branch, but you can come back in 
And on the underside, you can add a little bit, very dry brush, add a little bit of dark pigment, and you can add striations, little drop shadow. You can give visual interest to your branch, give it depth with multiple values. You could do little swirls. Maybe there's a little knot in your branch. Now, the only thing we have left to do for this bird, before this bird is absolutely done, depending on how you wanna touch it up, add things, blend things out, experiment. So I'm just gonna remove some water here, figure out how I want this to look. And you can lift I'm just drawing my brush on the towel and I'm lifting some of the pigment if it's too much. My head is very, very wet. You can even see the pool of water right here. So when I go to do an eyeball, it's all gonna bleed together. And the greatest thing about eyeballs is you want them to be crisp and clean. You don't want them to be too feathery. That's what really, really sells this image of a bird is the eyes and the feet. So, I'm going to get a different color for the eye. I'm gonna do blue, I think, or brown. I could do brown, or I could do it monochromatically. I have tons and tons of options. The important thing is, before you do the eye, the head has to be dry, okay? I'm not trying to rhyme on purpose, but I have to remove a little bit of pigment just because it's so, 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 so wet. So you can either go in with your pigment at its darkest value, if you're doing this monochromatically like I am, or go in with your darkest color, which could be sepia, uh, burnt umber. And you want to do a little circle. Here's how we're gonna do the eye. We're gonna do a circle, but we're gonna make sure that we don't color it all the way in. We want a little white dot in there, okay? We wanna keep the original page. So load up your brush real dry with the darkest pigment you have. This is gonna be small, but to get your eye to stand out, it has to be dark and you wanna have a little tiny bit of white. Now see how wet my page was, that it took that too far? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clean my brush in water. I'm gonna dry off my brush so it's dry and I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna lift this portion and reshape it. While your watercolor is wet, you can manipulate it and you can play with it. This is a watercolor bird. There you go. You can add fun little things. If you, if you want him to have a fun hair day, You can reshape him. You can even add like a little layer of water along the side if you want to sort of feather out the edges. If you don't like how hard lines those are, you can mess with the style. You can tweak it a little bit, go back in. Maybe you wanna add a little bit more, but you want it to look of a different value. You can just keep experimenting and messing around with it while it's still wet. Once it dries, your lines are gonna be hard um, and crystal clear, and it's gonna be hard to rework it and go back in. You can with some watercolor paper, you can keep going and keep experimenting, but some you cannot. Now I'm gonna add a little bit more pigment here of a little bit darker value, just because I want to get rid of the hard line I drew. And you can even have strokes like feathers. Okay, so I've come back in and I am trying to soften up this line. I get add little strokes, little feathers. This is your bird. This is his branch. You can keep going. You could absolutely keep going. If you wanted to, you could practice, practice the shape of leaves. So that could be a shape of a leaf. It could be sealed. 
real pointy ovals, pointy ovals. You could add leaves to your branch. You could have more branches. You can have more birds. They could be smaller. They could be in the distance. You can practice with drills all the silhouettes if you want. Practice adding shapes. You could have just a bird shape to practice. That could be your bird. To practice shape, to practice painting, you can do silhouettes. It's very fun, it's very helpful. I hope this video helps. Um, I'm not releasing an intermediate watercolor video just yet. For those of you that are mastering this, that wanna run through the drills, that wanna practice, if I upload a intermediate watercolor video right away, it could be very tempting to click on it and watch it. And with all that information and all the other information I'm going to provide in that video, it could be very overwhelming. And when you get overwhelmed, sometimes it can be very discouraging. And I never want art to be discouraging for you. I want art to be something that motivates, inspires, relaxes. It's just, it's something really, really fun that you can do. And <laughs> You can just keep practicing adding shapes to things everywhere. Five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day. Practice running through these different drills and challenges and building things up because watercolor is very much layers. Layers on layers on layers. And it takes time. It just takes time. So when learning a new skill like an instrument, an art, a language, allocate the proper amount of time for it and be very kind to yourself, be very patient with yourself. You're doing an absolutely amazing job and I'm just so thankful to you for wanting to try watercolor, for looking at this, for hanging out with me. This has been a lot of a video. I hope you have an absolutely wonderful week and I will talk to you later. Bye.